This is High School Not So Much a Musical, a podcast that takes you on a ride through the peaks and valleys of a high school journey. Here are your presenters, Nitin Jaladanti and Ayush Agarwal. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to High School Not So Much a Musical. Today, we are joined with Dr. Brian Parson, who has been all three of our AP government and politics teacher. I currently, I had him last year. Ayush and Nitin had him two years ago. Um, he used to be a lawyer. Now he teaches, like like I said, AP government to us or to to our high schoolers in school. So, uh, Dr. Parson, if you could give the viewers a quick introduction about yourself, that would be great. My name is Brian Parson. Uh, I've been teaching AP government for I think this is my eighth school year. And uh, my tenth school year uh, full time teaching. Um, and, uh, in addition to AP government, I teach uh, some capstone classes to seniors about crime and punishment and um, American history, cultural history during the nineteen uh, fifties and nineteen sixties. Are you also talking about how you? taught life skills a couple of times in cooking. So if you could talk about that a little bit, because that's quite interesting. Sure. Um, so myself and some other teachers had pushed for a few years that our seniors essentially have an open course um, that's on college counseling, where um, starting, you know, in August, they work through a course that guides them through the college application process. Um, they're on campus for the first trimester, two trimesters of the year. The second trimester ends in the middle of February, I think the 18th this year. Also, applications though, are pretty much all college applications and the interview process are all done in the middle of January. So essentially they were going to school for three weeks, um, with a class with nothing to do. And we said, you know, we're realizing that a lot of these students are graduating without wood shop, without metal shop, without economics, with, I mean, not economics, excuse me, without um, um, like cooking classes or classes on, you know, basic banking skills or, um, you know, there's no driver's ed course where they teach you how to maintain a vehicle. And so um, several teachers, we'd been complaining for a while, hey, we should use this last three to four weeks to uh, kids some life skills before they, you know, go off to college. Because um, we had, you know, several students telling us they didn't know how to uh, put air in tires or uh, how to balance a checkbook or um, I have students who didn't know how to make pasta. Um, and so... It just didn't seem right, you know, that we had this open time, we could use it to show some skills that students could use um, while they went off to college and, you know, beyond. So um, this started the year when we shut down for COVID in March. So that would have been like January 2020, right? And so <laughs> we started a cooking class and um i went through and we bought all these supplies that the school did and planned out a course um i wanted the students actually doing the cooking uh hands-on and uh it works when we didn't have to cook anything when we were uh the first day was like nice skills and so they chop i taught them how to chop chop some vegetables using different cutting techniques and they made salsa we made like two different kinds of salsa and that worked fine but um our cafeteria is indoors and um and our uh um, place where students eat is indoors we're not an outdoor campus like most of northern california and so they didn't when we bought these burners we didn't want to buy gas burners because we were nervous about being indoors and having students lighting flames and stuff in class. Because the way it was designed the first year was the whole senior class, about a hundred and something students, 
a little over a hundred. I think actually at that time it was like 120 something students. We're divided in two sections. So you're talking about 60 students and to have them in effective groups for cooking, they were, so they were being like groups of five at the most, that's 12 groups. So we had to have 12, at least the, we bought these 12, these 12 double burner electric burners they would go, but we were having problems with the power. So eventually it just turned into a watching us, watching me cook. And then I would cook a huge batch for them uh, early in the morning. And then I would work through cooking a small batch to have them observe. So it wasn't really the hands-on experience we had wanted it to be, but I, students did learn stuff. I would pull, you know, a few up to do it but it wasn't as much of a hands-on this year and so last school year 2021 january we were we weren't on campus so cooking didn't happen uh, i think they did it distance learning like someone picked up like gave a list of a few recipes they were going to do and gave the shopping list and then like you know kind of did a cook with me through zoom but um I was in the middle of moving, so I didn't have a kitchen to do it. Um, so I didn't do it. But then uh, this year we had been in talks about how we were gonna do it, how we were gonna make sure we didn't have the power issues and everything. But I think just with that and then, you know, COVID concerns and other things, they've decided to do it off campus um, this year. But I'm hopeful it will come back because I think it's fun for students, you know, to see I think it's necessary for students to learn how to do some basic cooking for themselves when they go off campus. I, I, I would like people to know that they can cook, you know, easy stuff very cheaply and how easy it is to make. You know, you don't have to be buying, I don't know, in and out of the night or whatever. But um, hopefully we'll turn back onto campus next year. So knock on wood, we'll be able to do it. Yeah, like I completely agree that like this, these are some essential life skills that like seniors should be taught because my sister, she's going to what she's going to college next year and she can't cook like anything. And like, I feel like the most like the most things that high school or sorry, that college for like freshmen make in their in their freshman year is like just instant ramen and like that that's really not good for you but i yeah i feel like it's a really great thing to be teaching high schoolers um like these essential skills that they're not taught on like an everyday like every day-to-day -day basis but the question i had for you was that like so right now you currently you teach like an assortment of classes but your main one is um ap government but before this like you were a lawyer so could you talk us about the process of maybe becoming a lawyer and like how you started off with it like what you mean like the graduate school and how long it takes and that kind of stuff i yeah basically like if if you were trying to like tell if you were trying to explain to a high schooler how you like became a lawyer like that's what we would want to know sure uh, so i mean like how i became a lawyer i <laughs> I, uh, you have to sit for an exam. So there's an interest exam for law school. It's called the LSAT, L-S-A-T. Um, and it, it's a screwy exam because it has nothing to do with law. It's all about logical thinking. And so there are like, there are these logic games and other things you have to do, uh, which I loved. It was always those ones of like, They'll give you a certain amount of names of people, a color, and where they sat at a table. And then they give you a bunch of hints and you have to figure out the name of the person, the color of their plate, and where they're sitting on the table or something. Um, and then, you know, other stuff you have to do uh, was the basis of this LSAT exam. And from that, then you apply into law school. And so, I applied to several places. I graduated from Santa Clara University. So that was one I uh, applied to. When I was applying to law school though, I had a child. Uh, so I couldn't, you know, the world wasn't as open to me as it may have been to some other people. Um, I had graduated 
two to three years before applying to law school um, because I had started doing something else and wasn't interested. Um, and so I decided to go back to go to law school. And so, um, yeah, so I had, you know, my eldest son was already born by the time I was applying to law school. And so I applied to Santa Clara. I applied to University of the Pacific and in San Francisco, USF, and and I got, um, I mean, the, the two that I was interested in were University of the Pacific and Santa Clara. And um, Santa Clara admitted me and uh, University of the Pacific admitted me and gave me a scholarship and admitted my um, at the time, girlfriend, but who has become my wife, admitted her too. So we both went to UOP. The reason I applied there was Sacramento. And so you have the state capital, you have a federal court, and you have a state court system there. And it seemed interesting to me. So that's where we went. Um, three years for law school. So three years if you're a full time student. Um, four years if you're part time. And so um, my wife and I were both part-time because we had a little one. So um, she went to school in the uh, evenings. I went to school in the mornings. And then at some point we flipped and it took us about three and a half years to graduate. Um, and then from graduation is the dreaded bar exam, which took about uh, six weeks to study for, uh, six intense weeks of like seven days a week you are studying and going through the whole process. And I pulled some things from learning about the bar exam, California bar exam has the lowest passage rate of any bar exam, um, they, um, in the country. And I think it's like 34% pass it, um, take it as many times as you want but it's only offered twice a year i think god it's been so long i don't remember a lot of this um i graduated in 2008 so that's almost 15 years ago 14 years ago now um but um we we studied non-stop my wife um in we graduated in may in april my uh my wife um seven yeah, it was 2008. So we had a eight, uh, almost 18 month old when we were studying for the bar exam. Uh, and uh, so, and God, how old would Ashton have been? Four. So a four year old and an eight, 18 month old when we were studying for the bar exam. And that was pretty intense. That was pretty crazy. Um, and the uh, three day exam, eight hours a day. And uh, the guy, you take this review, everybody takes this review class. Um, it's about six weeks, I think, five nights a week. So you study, you know, from about 8 a.m. to about uh, 4 a.m., 5 a.m. And then we would drive to wherever this review class was. And we'd be in the review class from about 5 to 9-ish, 9.30 at night. And then we go back home, go to bed, get up and do the next thing. Then your weekends, you didn't have class, but you were studying. So it was, you know, an entire summer dedicated to this exam. And uh, the guy told us, I quote oh, quite a bit about this review guy. This guy who led our review in, uh, in uh, class now to students. And one of the biggest things he said was, don't be a puddle on the floor. You know, uh, you're going to sit there for this exam. You're going to have a man moment of panic when you open. And, you know, if you're taking a standardized test, which you guys have, you're going to have that moment of panic when you open the exam, you look at the first prompt and like your mind goes completely blank and you're like, oh my God, I don't know anything. You start questioning your life choices. And then you like, there's then that kind of passes and there's this like, okay, I am prepared. I just got to find something that I know and start writing. 
And that was his point was, you know, don't be a puddle on the floor, you know, let that moment come, let it go. And then remind yourself you are prepared and just start, you know, with one question and build from there and you'll be able to go. Everybody has that anxiety. Everybody has that panic, but it's about how you come back from that. And uh, my wife and I both passed the exam on our first time. Um, and uh, yeah, she got a job right away. She was working for a law firm in Santa Clara, right by Santa Clara University. She started doing bankruptcy law. Um, I clerked for a federal judge. And yeah. And I've been out on my own and uh, I started doing criminal law and uh, some special education advocacy for students with special ed. I enjoyed that. Um, what I didn't enjoy was the hours. There's a lot of, you know, I think the law is really over dramatized. Like, you know, there's not an accurate television show or an accurate movie on what it means to practice law and so i think a lot of people go into it without understanding what that is or knowing if it's a good personality match for them i get asked by a lot of um kids hey i want to be a lawyer or uh from parents my kid wants to be a lawyer what do you recommend and the number one thing i recommend is Find a law office that will let you work for a summer. Do anything. Tell them you'll work for free. Tell them you'll scrub the floors, whatever. But you just want to be in. You'll make copies. You'll grab coffee, whatever it is. But you'll work for free. You'll do anything to get in there. And experience what it's like for those lawyers working in a law office for, you know, you know, five days a week, eight hours a day. Yeah, well, check that. Lawyers don't work uh, eight hours a day, five days a week. You work way more than that. And so, you know, 60 hours a week. Um, so I would get experience to what it means to work in a law office before you put in the time and the money uh, to get that law degree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but now now I'm wondering, like, you're a teacher now, like, why would you want to, like, switch from becoming a lawyer to, like, becoming a teacher? Because obviously, you know, like, your paycheck decreased a lot. I mean, I get, I guess that, like, you know, one, one reason could have been, like, the, like, you the hours. You think that hours. my paycheck decreased a lot, but you have no idea what, how much money I made. Like, right now? Oh, would you like to tell us? No. Oh, okay. But you, oh, you're okay. making an assumption. You have no idea how much money I make. And you have no idea how much I made as a lawyer. There are lots of, and this is the other one. We can chalk this up here. That this idea that lawyers make hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, sure. There are a lot of uh, lawyers make hundreds of thousands of dollars. But there are a lot of poor lawyers too. A lot of lawyers that make like, you know, between fifty to seventy thousand dollars a year. There's not a you're you again. You have we all have this impression that lawyers are you know super wealthy. There are a lot of them who are, yeah, sure, but there are plenty of lawyers who are not what you think it they're making. And, and, the there kind of raises, teachers, yeah. and there are a lot of teachers who aren't making what you think they're making. So, so I guess like what Rishi's asking is, the, let, let's assume that the average salary. There's a lot lawyer, to life beyond a paycheck. There's a lot more to life beyond a paycheck. There's a lot of expectations in being a lawyer that you got to make some choices. What kind of life do you want to have? Uh, do you want to have a life, you know, do you want your career to be in your life? 
period. You want to be able to have a career where you make a good living, but at the end of the day, you get to leave work at work. Okay. Uh, both my wife and I were lawyers. My wife was, my wife was rated in the top. Uh, what was that award? Oh God, she's gonna kill me for get it, for forgetting it. But it was top fifty lawyers under thirty in San Francisco. I mean, excuse me, in the Bay Area. Uh, and she left the law too um, because oh, she's gonna mess. She's gonna kill me if I screwed that up. I don't think that it's close. It's something like that. Um, but she, we both didn't like it. It's ang it's a lot of anxiety. Oh, it's a lot of expect. You know, we have three kids, and I wanted I wanted to be present for my kids. My my I didn't grow up. Um, you know, I didn't grow up wealthy. My 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 dad worked. My mom didn't. My dad uh, had a high school diploma, and um, his dad was a was a truck driver, and then ran a truck driving a truck driver terminal, and then he started. My dad started driving trucks and started running a terminal, and so when I was a kid, we didn't have much money, and uh, by the time I was in high school, my dad went off with another guy and started his own business. And then he started doing better and better. But when I was young, we didn't have much. And so he was working. Uh, he worked. He was up at 5 a.m. and was home about 7 at night. And then, you know, same thing the next day. Uh, he coached my baseball team. Uh, but as far as, like, making it there for things for us or, like, you know, that was all my mom. My mom took us to the dentist appointments. My mom took us to our doctor's appointments. My mom met with our teachers. My dad couldn't have picked my teachers out of a line. <laughs> and I, I didn't, and, you know, I love my dad, and I think he did a great job. And, you know, he, he had the hand he was dealt. You know, he, he did what he could with what he had. But I didn't want that. I, uh, I have, uh, you know, I went to, I got a graduate degree and it's given me flexibility to choose the life that I want to have. And I wanted a life where I could be present for my children. I think if you ask anyone, you know, an admin around school, they know that my kids come first. I have no problem uh, saying I'm not going to be here for this because, you know, I'm going to you know, Luca's got a, a basketball tournament or Larissa's in a play and I'm taking her to go do something, you know, get her uh, makeup done before the play or something. But I'm not, you know, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't have been able to do that as a lawyer, I think is what I'm telling you. You know, there's all these firms that tell you, oh, yeah, we're parents too. I think my wife got this speech and I got this speech too. We're parents too, so we understand if you want to take off, you know, for baseball games or whatever. But then when you're hired and you're working there, you're given glances, you're given glares, things come up about, you know, why are you taking this time off? You need to hit your billable hours. Um, and, and we didn't want that. I didn't want that. And, it, you know, uh, Sitting there and researching and writing was not interesting to me. And I'd much rather, you know, work with high school students who are in a contentious situation. How about that? So does any part of you ever feel like, oh, I wasted three years of my life in law school? Or do you think no, it like... I wouldn't have... No, because my law degree opens many doors. I wouldn't have been given, I wouldn't be working at the school without my law degree. There's no way. The law degree opens doors. So, Wait, I mean, it's not it's, enough to just have like a teaching credential and then work at basis? I guess, but I don't know. I think I was taken more seriously because I had the law degree. If you think about a lot of your teachers, they do have that. They do have a doctorate, right? There are some who don't, but they have a lot of experience. 
if you think about Mr. Small or Mr. Meyerowitz, they have a ton of experience, a lot of teaching experience. I didn't. I mean, I taught at, you know, another local Bay Area school, private school, that uh, shall remain nameless, and please don't say the name. I, I but remember, it wasn't. I remember that. But it I, wasn't. I was in the school. But it wasn't really teaching. They they have a set curriculum, and you can't vary from it. There is no teacher autonomy whatsoever, and so anyone could kind of do it. You know, they knew that they could pull anyone from the street to come and teach this, and so it wasn't really teaching. So to come in and be able to teach in a brand new school in the first year where they want to have students who, I mean, excuse me, um, you know, they want to build a reputation. I don't think I would have been taken as seriously if I didn't have that graduate. That's I liked it. I liked getting that degree. I liked law school. I enjoyed it. Um, I be way better at it now to be honest um but i didn't uh, yeah i wouldn't change it i would change not i may have changed some things like um i mean law school debt is a serious thing <laughs> talk to any lawyer or uh you know medical school debt is a real thing <laughs> talk to any uh, uh any uh, uh doctor so um you know, there probably would be some things I would change, some things I wish I was smarter about, but no, I wouldn't. So you talked a lot about politics, or sorry, not, uh, talked a lot about your law experiences now and kind of why you shifted from law to teaching. So now we can talk a little bit more about teaching itself. So uh, obviously, as Rishi mentioned, teach, you teach. AP government and politics. So could you talk about the importance for high schoolers to learn about AP government and politics? And if you could also talk about some of the other capstones you teach and what those are about, what are the importance of those, et cetera. Question to me to ask, what is the importance of taking this class? I don't, I don't well, like, what is the importance of taking biology? Well, I mean, if somebody wants to go into bio. It only works for people who want to go into biology? Yeah, pretty much. You don't think you learn anything from biology if you don't use it? Well, I think, I think, that, I think. If you don't go to biology, if you don't, you know. I think. Get a science I don't understand. That. I think the, the amount of in-depth knowledge that you learn from AP Biology a lot of it is useless if, you, if you're not going to get a science degree, right? Otherwise, you could just like learn like basic, basic biology. I just never thought of my education that way. I thought I always thought of my education as teaching me to to think and ex giving me multiple experiences. And those experiences or some of those experiences would be of great interest to me that I'd want to study them more. For me, it was history and economics. I love those classes, um, by far my favorites. And I don't know, but I wouldn't say that like taking AP bio turned me off to bio biology or that I thought it was a waste. And it was teaching me how to think or, or how to digest scientific information, I guess. I don't, I don't know. I just never thought about it that way. But I guess what I always tell students is that I think government is the most important class that you'll take because I think no matter what you do in life, government and politics should relate to you because you live in a democracy and part of living in a democracy is this need to participate. And we want people participating. <laughs> we have plenty of people participating who have no clue <laughs> who 
<laughs> what's going on or how to think about issues um, or, you know, relationships among um, different political institutions. So to me, it's the one class that is going to definitely relate to everyone. I don't think that you're being honest with yourself if you say, boy, I didn't need to know. I mean, if you're evaluating the courses like this, I don't know how you could walk away from AP Gov and saying, I don't need to know that. Because how can you live in a democracy and say that you don't need to understand how it works? So, that's me. I'm very biased, though. I don't know if you know that. Um, but I do think the class is super important. And I think that students, I think, you know, when you sit back and I mean, maybe Ayush and Nitin, you're at this point already, but maybe at, at definitely at some point you'll look back and you go, wow, Gov was a pretty easy class now that I look at it looking back. But I think it's hard for students, for most students in ninth grade, there are plenty of students who it's not hard for, and that's fine, that's great. But I mean, hopefully I add something new or some new kind of thinking about it for you. But I think for a lot of students at the first glance, it's difficult because they've never had to think about the information that they're learning in the way that the course requires. That they've never had to, you know, they've learned about um, the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. But they've never really learned, and they've learned about checks, the idea of checks and balances and separation of powers. But I don't think that they've ever learned how they all connect and work together, and certainly not to the extent of thinking about influences of other institutions like political parties and interest groups and the media and how that all connects together. And certainly not the in-depth look at civil rights and civil liberties that are required of the courts. But I've had plenty of students and plenty of parents who come and say, you know, I now feel like I can listen to the news or watch the news and I know what's going on. It makes sense to me. I understand when, you know, the implications of a Supreme Court justice saying he's retiring and how it works, you know, and why it's why the why this Supreme Court justice is doing this now. Why is he retiring now while the Democrats control both houses of Congress and the White House? Why is he doing that now? And what is that going to look like? And what kind of justice is this person, is this president going to pick? And why is that important? Why does that matter? Um, that that's important. And that when they see someone like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or something get called to testify in front of Congress, that they understand you know, not just what's happening. Well, I guess like literally what's happening, right? Like why is Mark Zuckerberg there and why is he answering questions and why is he doing what he's doing? But also what are the motivations of the politicians who are calling him to do that? You know, why is this congressman asking these kind of questions? And why is this congressman asking, you know, those kind of questions? And what is the goal here? And what are they hoping to do? And what is, you know, why is Facebook in front of Congress or why is Congress dealing with Facebook at a time when, you know, we have so many other things going on? But I think that it's really important for people to start thinking about that. And the other thing is that I hope it gets kids, you know, kids, I shouldn't say kids, young adults involved in to voting and participating at a minimum um, because... <laughs> Um, the most ignored group, right? You have voting power, but you're probably the most ignored and the least cared about because you often don't vote and you don't pay taxes. So you don't pay the kind of taxes, you know, that someone in their, you know, older years, not older years, but older than a young adult would be paying. So I want, I think that in order to be a better democracy, we need to have more diversity in voices. And I think that young adults are someone who can 
full full more, I guess. Um, how's that? Did that answer your question? Yeah, I think that like does a really good job of answering our question because like you were saying that AP Gov was probably like one of the easiest APs that we took. And I think that because we took the AP online, it was a lot easier because I think Ayush can testify for this, that the multiple choice is brutal for Gov. Like it's one of, like there's so much memorization that you have to do, which makes well, yeah, sense. It's not, it's not memorization any, I mean, it's not strict memorization, right? Yeah. Like you have to memorize, like you have to know the terms. Monster vocab. To know how to, to know how to apply them. Yeah, so, so it's, that's, what, it's that's a like lot more monster vocab. That's our show for today. Now roll the credits. High School Not So Much a Musical is hosted by Ayush Agarwal, Nitin Jaladanki, and Rishi Sinha. Narration by Samhit Kadala. Music from Louis Luang Relaxation Cafe, Tune Pocket, and Infraction. If you like the show, please recommend it to your friends and family. Thank you so much for listening. And-